Um, and so Psalm 65, if you turn there, and we'll read together the Word of God. Psalm 65 for the choir director. A Psalm of David. A song. There will be silence before you in praise in Zion, O God. And to you the vow will be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you all men come. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, you forgive them. How blessed is the one whom you choose and bring near to you to dwell in your courts. We will be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds you answer us in righteousness, O God of our salvation. You who are the trust of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest sea. Who establishes the mountains by his strength, being girded with might. Who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples. They who dwell in the ends of the earth stand in awe of your signs. You make the dawn and the sunset shout for joy. You visit the earth and cause it to overflow. You greatly enrich it. The stream of God is full of water. You prepare the grain, for thus you prepare the earth. You water its furrows abundantly. You settle its ridges. You soften it with showers. You bless its growth. You have crowned the year with your bounty and your paths drip with fatness. The pastures of the wilderness drip and the hills gird themselves with rejoicing. The meadows are clothed with flocks and the valleys are covered with grain. They shout for joy. Yes, they sing. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you for how it guides us, gives us warnings, commands, and yet as we see tonight, it, it, it directs our hearts to sing. So Father, as we study, I pray that it would be so much more than just looking at words on a page, but Father, that you would stir our hearts that an affection in our hearts be stirred up. We would love you above all things, so much so that we want to sing and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, if you haven't already, let's look at Psalm chapter 65. I want to ask you this question as we start out tonight. Have you ever thought about why you give praise to the things in your life that you do. Why do we speak lovingly, enthusiastically about some things and not others? The answer is simple. We praise what we love. We praise what we think to be praiseworthy. Think about it a different way. In an opposite way, we find it odd or even funny when, someone is, when we hear someone praise something we think is not praiseworthy. Some examples. Isn't this the most glorious traffic jam you've ever seen? That is the most delicious saltine cracker I think I've ever had. What an incredible Florida game. It's just all different kinds of things. I feel a little weird even as I say it. Oh, it's amazing. But why do we feel weird when we say these kinds of things? It's because praise is the fulfillment of enjoying the things we enjoy. God has rigged this world in such a way that in the overflow of our enjoyment, we have to tell people about it. The things we love the most, we praise. And in this psalm, we see David not only praising God, but assigning ownership of all praise to someone. He gives ownership of all praise to God. And I want you to look, if just take a, take a second and just glance over the entirety of the psalm. How many times does David use the personal pronoun I or me? Very few. How many times does David use the personal pronoun you or your? It's all over the place. So there is, very, there is one very specific focus, one very specific object of praise and adoration in this psalm, and it's God himself. And 
so he assigns ownership of all praise to God for three key reasons. And so if I could squeeze the whole message into one sentence tonight, it would be this. It's that God rightly deserves all praise for his grace, for his strength, and for his provision. God rightly deserves all praise for his grace, his grace, his grace, his strength, and his provision. Amen. Let's go home. Right? That was a good sermon. Nope. Let's move on. All right. First, I want to break that statement down throughout the rest of the message. So first, number one, God rightly deserves all praise. Let's look at verses one and two. There will be silence before you and praise in Zion, O God. And to you, the vow will be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you, all men come. Right out of the gate, we hit a kind of a tough phrase here in verse one. And it seems that like no matter what translation you look at, it has a different way to translate this first verse. And so I think maybe to help us here, um, we're going to look at a couple of things. First of all, just to set the groundwork, let's think about when. When is David talking about here? If you look at the the entirety of the psalm, um, it seems as if David is writing at a time of harvest. Talking about the bounty of the earth and and how God has provided and things like that. And so um, it seems like, and some commentators seem to agree with this, that that maybe David is writing at the time of of a, a festival, a feast, maybe the Feast of Booths in the fall, the Feast of Tabernacles. The the harvest is coming in and they're celebrating God's providence and they're remembering God's providence uh, during the the wilderness wanderings where for 40 years they're wandering around in the desert and God provides them with food that falls down out of the sky. But then also here in verse one, he uses something we don't expect. He says, there will be silence. So, He's, he's thinking about what's going on around him, but also there's, there's something that he's looking forward to. There's a, there's a future reality that hasn't come fully to fruition yet. Secondly, let's think about where. It says, there will be silence before you and praise in where? Zion. Zion. I don't know if, how much you know about Zion. It's, it's a, it was a Jebusite fortress in, in the middle of the city of Jerusalem. David conquered it, and it later became, the title Zion was applied to the city, the whole city of Jerusalem. It was applied to the mountain, uh, the, the temple mountain. It was also, it's also used a lot to refer to God's eternal city, the, the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And so the idea here is that in God's city of Zion, whether it's earthly Jerusalem, whether it's heavenly Jerusalem, that praise, praise is waiting for the Lord. And it's in, in the way that the, it's Hebrew is beautiful here. Like, praise is waiting for the Lord as a servant waits for the return of his master. It's waiting humbly, silently. Why? Because all praise belongs to God. Church family, we may give praise to a lot of things every day, which is not necessarily wrong. But what are these things in comparison to God? We may praise, we, uh, may the praise of anything or anyone else not distract us from a single, unwavering, passionate life of praise to Jesus Christ. And may our praise of other things seem like silence in comparison to the praise that should erupt from our hearts when we think about the Lord Jesus and his beauty. Maybe even you could ask yourself as you're thinking about other things, as our hearts are drawn to different things throughout the day, can I praise God for the thing that I have in front of me right now? Can I rightly attribute this thing that whatever it is that I'm praising, this person, if I, can I rightly attribute it this by the way that I, by the way that it's introduced in my life, by the way that I attach myself to it, by the way that I think about it, by the priority it has in my life, can I rightly and humbly pr- praise God for this as a gift? And if we can't, then maybe we need to ask some other questions as well. 
And then it says, David says, and to you the vow will be performed. May have been referencing vows that, that farmers make to the Lord during the growing season. Could even be a vow that was made by the nation to the Lord, maybe in a time of drought, a time of danger. But in a greater sense, Israel knew that as God's people, they were his covenant people. They were in a covenant with him. One that, um, and, and alongside that, we, we know in a greater sense that we are, we are under a covenant as well. One that we are sealed with at the day, the day of our, our conversion. We're accountable to God for obeying what he's commanded us to do by faith. Chiefly, to, to live for the, for the advancement of the gospel. Looking forward to the great day when all men come, as this verse says. As verse 2 says, to you, all men come. We look forward to a day when we will see that in its fullest sense. When every knee will bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And with such a great day approaching, church family, do we praise him with our lips only for our hands to reveal that our hearts are far from him? Do we come here and we sing and we pray and we, we give and we study only for us to, live, to leave and to live the rest of the week as practical atheists, as if God doesn't even exist? Are we failing to perform our vows? Lord, help us by your grace to honor you with praise and obedience that rightly belongs to you. So God rightly deserves all praise. Number two, for his grace. God rightly deserves all praise for his grace. Look at verse two, verse two through four. Oh, you who hear prayer, to you all men come. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, you forgive them. How blessed is the one whom you choose and bring near to you to dwell in your courts. We will be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. David shows us in verses 2 through 4 that that great undeserved favor that that God abundantly pours out on his people. We see that in a couple of different ways. First, we see that he graciously hears. He graciously hears. Our world is full of gods. Have you noticed that? Seems like there's a deity behind every tree. But Romans 1 shows us that that only appears to be that way because our foolish human race, in its self professed wisdom, as Romans 1 tells us, that we exchange the truth of God for a lie. We've, we've made and we've worshiped idols in the images of men and birds and animals and sports teams and money and games, and jobs, and pay raises. We've we've exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and we serve the creature rather than the creator of all. Listen to what the Bible says about these idols. It's from Psalm 115. Starting in verse 4, it says, They, they are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. And listen to this. They have ears, but they cannot hear. If you're in the sound of my voice tonight or listening to this on the internet sometime later on, please hear me. All these other gods or forces or objects, they are nothing more than the scheme of the devil to drown out the truth of the gospel in your ears. Don't buy the lie. Not a single one of them can hear your prayers but the God of the Bible. And listen, not only does he graciously hear, but secondly, he graciously forgives. Praise God. Praise God, he graciously forgives. Verse three, iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, you forgive them. David uses two different words for sin here in verse three. He says iniquity, literally a twisting, a perverting of what is good. And David says this This iniquity, it prevails against me. It is showing itself to be greater and stronger than I am, David says. And then he parallels it. And I love how the Old Testament, you'll see a couple of different words, similar words all along together to show the strength of this idea. He says, he parallels it with another word, transgression. Transgression, which means rebellion. So there's this perversion, this twisting of what is good and and outright high-handed rebellion. 
These are dominating things, the dom- dominating themes in the story of every human being, not just David. They're dominating themes in, in our own lives, aren't they? How many times this week have we said, Lord, iniquity prevails against me. Transgression prevails against me. In our sinful nature, we rebel against God as king and our hearts are twisted into something ugly, greatly deceitful and desperately sick. Sin is a spiritual cancer and it will prevail against us until we look to the great physician. David says, David says, all this iniquity and transgression, though they prevail and overpower me, you forgive. And that word forgive is beautiful. It literally means to atone for, to provide a wrath-removing sacrifice for. That's good news. Some people say, why can't God just forgive me? Because it's more, it's more difficult than that. Something has to die the Bible tells us. David was thinking of an Old Testament sacrifice where he only saw the shadow. We see the substance. We see the substance in Jesus Christ. Praise God for Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who offered himself as an atoning, wrath-removing sacrifice for our sin. He is the one who hears and forgives. And listen to this. Listen to this. He graciously chooses and draws near. Verse four says, how blessed is the one whom you choose and bring near to you to dwell in your courts. While we were all dead and far off in sin, unwilling and unable to come to God, enemies of God and rightly deserving his eternal wrath. And yet God reached down and kindled life in our cold, dead hearts. Not because of anything good we had done or ever would do, but because of his great grace. He drew us near in in kindness. He showed us the depth of our sin through the gospel in our need for a savior. And he led us to repentance and faith in his priceless son. And he declared us not guilty. He adopted us as sons and daughters so that while we were once, we were once far off and we would have cowered in fear at the thought of the nearness of God. Now, now God's nearness, like Psalm 73 says, God's nearness is my good. It's my good. Can you say that tonight, church, that the nearness of God is your good? In the midst of everything else that may be happening in your life, can you say that the nearness of God is your good? No, he's our our good. He's our ultimate satisfaction. Because the God who hears and forgives and chooses to, and draws us near, he, he graciously satisfies. He graciously satisfies. The second half of verse 4 says, We will be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. David sought God's presence in a specific place. In the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. And I want you to think about this. He's using the word temple here. The temple hasn't been built yet. He's looking forward in time. He, that's what, remember, David wanted to go ahead and start the building of the temple. And God says, hold up, buddy. That's not your job. That's going to be your son's job. So what did David do? David, the rest of his life, David's pulling things together, getting everything ready so that when Solomon comes in, then Solomon can build the temple. He's preparing for the temple. And he dreamed of the day that his son would be able to do this. But now, now in Christ, we are the temple. In Christ, his Holy Spirit dwells in us that we may, what? Abide with him. Not just dropping by for a visit, but that we get to live life with him. We get to know him. And we get to live being constantly satisfied by his presence. Joy in a manner that our Old Testament brothers and sisters longed for. Thank you, God, that we don't have to worship on this mountain or on that mountain, but that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. 
And we look forward by faith to an even greater day when our faith will become sight. And we get to be with God in his place, in his presence forever. Church family, are you relying moment by moment now on Jesus Christ? Are you relying on him as the satisfaction of your soul? Do you long for that day when we we have unfettered, unhindered pleasure and full joy forever with him? Or are you crawling from here to there in the dirt and the dust of this world, trying to, trying to suck moisture from the dirt that isn't there? Water that's not there. Are you hewning for yourself cisterns that can't hold water? Or are you going to the fountain of living water? Come to the fountain, Jesus Christ. Drink deeply and be satisfied in him. So God rightly deserves all praise for his grace and for his strength. Number three, for his strength. Look at verse five. It says, by awesome deeds you answer us in righteousness, O God of our salvation. You who are the trust of all the ends of the earth and the farthest sea, who establishes the mountains by his strength, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples. They who dwell in the ends of the earth stand in awe of your signs. You make the dawn and the sunset shout for joy. In verses 5 through 8, David portrays the power and the authority with which God answers his people. Praise God, he answers us. It may not be the way we want him to, but he answers. And his answers are always the best. He answers in such a way, I want you to see this, and we'll see this in this passage. He answers in such a way that he draws out the awe and the wonder and even the fear of his people. It says, you answer us, in verse 5, with awesome. Literally, that word means frightful. You answer us with frightful deeds, but, but see this. Don't fear, because his His deeds, his awesome deeds, these frightful deeds, they are always righteous. They are always right and good. Not in balance, right? Awesome deeds and righteousness, not not 50-50 as if they need to temper each other or balance each other out, but in perfect union. 100% and 100%. In perfect union, according to his wisdom and his purpose. We've seen God do such things as we've gone through this series, haven't we? I got to preach a few, uh, several weeks back now, I guess, on Psalm 46. We saw where God laid an entire army to waste. An entire army. Gone. Why? Because that army was on the verge of wiping his people, God's people, off the map. And when the morning dawned and, the, and God's people walked outside the city of Jerusalem and they saw the utter desolation that God had wreaked the night before, hear God's proclamation to his people. That verse that we like to put on our coffee cups, cease striving. See this army that I just wiped out for you? One that you were afraid of. You're thinking, how in the world can we come back from this? Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And you know, I think the nation of Judah would would not have chosen beforehand to face potential destruction. Would you? I don't think I would either. But in God's plan, according to God's wisdom, that was the very means by which God stirred up awe and wonder and faith in the hearts of his people. And so church, I want to challenge you, aim your life, your daily choices, your daily decisions, aim them towards knowing God better. 
being closer to him, being made more like him, and to ask God to help you in that, that he would produce the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And that, mean, that seems like it's a little bit of a sidestep from everything, we else, everything else we just talked about, but here's why. Often we fear to ask God for those things, don't we? Hey, don't pray for patience, because guess what? Something's going to happen that's going to require patience, right? We fear that. We joke about that, right? No, don't pray for that, you know? We fear this because God might do some kind of inconvenient, some kind of stressful, some kind of fearful, some kind of terrible thing as a means of producing those traits in us. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon had to say. He says, we do not always know what we're asking for when we pray. When the answer comes, the veritable answer, it is, it is possible that we may be terrified by it. We seek sanctification, and trial will be the reply. We ask for more faith, and more affliction is the result. We pray for the spread of the gospel, and persecution scatters us. Nevertheless, listen to this church, nevertheless, it is good to ask on. For nothing which the Lord grants in his love can do us any harm. Can anybody say amen? Terrible things will turn out to be blessed things after all when they come in answer to prayer. Man, that's good. And if you can't say amen, you got to say ouch, right? How many times have I said those things? So be encouraged in Christ, even though it may look Horrible on the outside. In Christ, we know it's all good things. In the ultimate scheme of things, it's all good things. Look at verse 5. It says, you are the trust of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest sea. People, all people everywhere, whether they realize it or not, no matter who they're worshiping or not, they really are completely dependent upon the Lord, aren't they? That's the beauty of common grace, that in God, every one of us lives and moves and has our being. The very breath that the atheist uses to, de- to curse God is a gift that God has given him. And how much better is it for us, those of us who know Christ, that we can, we can rejoice and we can join with, with David in saying things like this. As he is the God of all creation, we can say things like this. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, yet behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. Praise God. He is God of it all. And no matter where we may find ourselves in this great big world, If we call to him, we'll find that he is a very present help. Look at verse 6. It says, Who establishes the mountains by his strength, being girded with might. This is one of those lists. He's part of the list that he's he's giving here. And it says who. Who's the who? God. All right. So the God of our salvation is the God of creation. Possessing all power and might so that the very mountains were established by the word of his mouth. If if the words of his mouth can establish mountains, then who can stand against him? Be encouraged when the situation before you seems insurmountable. The God that you're trusting is the one who established the mountains by his strength. And I love verse 7. We look at verse 7, you see the very power of God over nature and the nations. I love this play on words here. He says, the God who calms the roar of the seas, the roaring of their waves, roaring, roaring. And then the word tumult is actually the same kind of word. It means roaring, right? So he says, the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the roaring of the nations. And he will bring peace upon them all. So much so that verse 8 tells us that they who dwell in the ends of the earth stand in awe of your signs. You make the dawn and the sunset shout for joy. The result is seeing God's hand at work. The result of seeing God's hand at work is awe and wonder. Because these are we're talking about things that nobody else can do. I mean, rightly did the disciples say, Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Right? 
Who is this that can speak peace over the nations and instantly there's peace? I look forward to that day, don't you? Because every day, it just, when I look at the news, it seems like this world would, would never be able to come to a state of peace. But that day is coming. Praise God, it's coming. And so the question really then to ask is are, are you among those who stand in awe of him now? Are you, are you, are you, do you have eyes to see what God is doing in the world around us? Because there will come a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, but not all will do so willingly. As the old song goes, the greatest, the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. So are you trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? So God rightly deserves all praise for his grace, his strength, and for his provision. For his provision. Verses 9 through 13 show us how God gives mankind everything it needs. And not in a stingy way, like, I'm going to give you some things, but I'm going to keep some things back for myself. No. Right? But abundantly, according to the riches of his grace. Verse 9 and 10. You visit the earth and you cause it to overflow. You greatly enrich it. The stream of God is full of water. You prepare their grain, for thus you prepare the earth. You water its furrows abundantly. You settle its ridges. You soften it with showers. You bless its growth. God didn't just form the earth. I love this. He not just formed it, but he filled it. Right? He created it in such a way that it would flourish and act. And and now, even now, Right? We talked about deism this past week. On Wednesday night, we talked about how there's some people that, that see God as the great watchmaker, that he kind of wound it up and let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Yeah, so anyway. Uh, that he, he let it, but he just let it go, and he lets it roll, and he lets it do its thing according to the way that he designed it. No. The Bible tells us that, that Jesus Christ actively is holding this universe together. He upholds it by the word of his power. He sustains it moment to moment by his power and by his grace. He sustains it, giving it moment by moment all that life on earth needs, all that life in this universe needs to survive. And though this world is marred by sin, we can still see mountains of evidence of his power and his divine nature. All you have to do is open your eyes and look around. Look at verse 11. It says, you've crowned the year with your bounty and your paths drip with fatness. The pastures of the wilderness drip and the hills gird themselves with rejoicing. The meadows are clothed with flocks and the valleys are covered with grain. They shout for joy. Yes, they sing. God's gracious provision. I want you to see this. It says, you crown the year. What does that mean? It means that his gracious provision encircles the entire year as a crown encircles the head. Isn't that beautiful? There's not a moment of the year that God isn't actively providing, sustaining, and blessing. And then it says, your paths drip with fatness. What in the world does that mean? The idea here, the word pass there is literally wagon tracks. So let's go for a journey here. It's as if God's wagon, as he passes throughout the land, is overflowing with an abundance of blessing and he's leaving a trail of blessings in his wake. No matter what your location, no matter what your occupation, think about this. He says, right, the, he says, the meadows are clothed with flocks, the valleys are covered with grain. That's somebody's livelihood, right? Different geographic places, different landforms, a whole different way of doing business. And yet, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, God is actively blessing you. I'm not, I'm not saying this is like a name it and claim it kind of thing, but I mean, the way that we have life, the way that, God, that, we, that our lives are sustained is by the blessing and the grace of God. 
So when you feel like you've had a horrible day, look around and see God's blessing at work in your life. He is far more gracious toward us than we ever dreamed. He has blessed us so much more than, we would ever, than we've ever given him credit for. You can see God's blessings plainly. They are shouting and they are singing and proclaiming the goodness of their creator. My great-grandfather farmed his whole life just outside of a small town called Tennell, Georgia. I remember he, he, he would talk about how it's hard for a farmer to not believe in God, to go every spring with nothing but a bag of seeds and a field of dirt to the bounty of fall's harvest, he was reminded every day that he could, he could plant and he could water, but only God could give the growth. Whether you're in Christ or not, we can see the provision of the Lord in the world around us. We can see his strength in it because, let me put it this way, we can see his power and his divine nature, but nature only tells part of the story. God's word reveals to us the full beauty of this picture, how we were created to know him and to praise him, praise that was due to him, that belongs to him, to praise him above all things and to, cult, and to represent him and to cultivate this earth that he's given us to live on. And though we fell captive to sin and failed to honor him as God or give him the praise that he deserves, yet he sent his son to redeem us from sin and death and to restore us to the very thing that he created us to do. Think about that. We hear so much talking about, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. You're freed for a purpose. God has has redeemed you from the curse of the law so that you may bless him, that you may know him, that you may serve him all the days of your life. That's what you were created for. And there is no better calling than that. It's not a bait and switch. It's the ultimate upgrade. Because you're getting to do the very thing for which you were created. Friend, do you know this God who is worthy of all praise? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ who is the only way to God? Church family, are you praising God? Do you praise him with that understanding that all of it belongs to him? And not begrudgingly, like, I have to praise God now, I guess. But in seeing his goodness, how he has met every physical need that you have. Every healing that ever takes place in your life is because of the Lord. And how... Even more than material blessings, he is the satisfaction of our souls. When we have nothing else, we have him. And when we have him, he is all that we need. Are you praising him, First Baptist Church of Great Gables? Because God rightly deserves all praise for his grace, for his strength, and for his provision. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for how you love us and how you provide for us. Father, I thank you so much that even those who don't know you, that they, that they are recipients of grace as well. Father, would you stir up our hearts, those that know you. Stir us up that we would know you, and that we would love you, and that we would praise you out of the overflow of this joy that you've given us. Open our eyes to see your blessing. And may we attribute them rightly to you. Father, there there may be someone here that doesn't know Christ. Lord, I pray that you would open their eyes to see how there has never been a moment that you haven't cared for them. There's never been a moment where, (laughs) where they did anything on their own the very breath they breathe, the very beat of their heart in this moment is a gift. Father, would you help them to see their need for a Savior? Father, there are many in our community that don't know Christ in the Jacksonville area, in the southeast, to the ends of the earth. There are people that don't know you. Lord, would you 
Would you open our eyes to see this reality? There are places around us in this world where worship of you does not exist. And that is, they're giving praise to everything else under the sun except for you. Lord, may we not stand for it. May we stand up and may we declare the God of all creation is worthy of all praise. May we do it with our words, may we do it with our lives, as we do our jobs, as we talk about things, as we go throughout our daily life. Because, Lord, you are worthy of it all. Would you work in us now as we respond in Jesus' name? Amen.